Give me, or shall I use the microphone? Okay, good. Um, well, first, thanks are in order. Uh, first one, as you well know, you especially, Wolfgang, I uh, dislike biographies, autobiographies, most precisely my own. Uh, introductions of, of this sort always give me a bit of discomfiture. I dislike sitting in front of a crowd at the head of the table inside a spotlight, and I spent most of my life trying to avoid that. Nonetheless, one has to concede to certain um, protocols, um, not the least of which is uh, a series of remerciements, of thank yous. First, thank you to Wolfgang Schiermacher. Uh, I like to position this in, in this way. I like to tell the story because everything, in a way, conforms itself as a kind of narrative. And so the narrative uh, for us is a really short one. I like to tell it in this way. When I first met Wolfgang, he insulted me. I criticized him. It became the basis for a very fine friendship and a great respect. <laughs> so uh, in that, my thank you to uh, Wolfgang Schiermacher. Thank you. Uh, my second, my second uh, set of, of thanks go to my current students, whom uh, I owe a debt and for whom I apologize. You will find some of this a little bit familiar, hopefully a little bit resonant, and I hope you will also find a little bit of the touch of your inflection from our very fine conversations about Foucault over the past couple of days. So thank you for truly fine conversations that has helped me to think this presentation uh, very much. Thanks. Uh, thirdly, um, while I'm, I often offer advice to uh, students, when you have to stand up in front of an audience, remember everything you do, every accident, glitch, infelicity, goes to the performative. It's all part of the presentation. So um, I tell myself that in this moment, taking some sort of solace in that, because I can't take solace in uh, the coherence and presence of a completed text. I can offer you only a kind of schema, a sketch, if you will, uh, a series of, of questions, the possibility of uh, conversation, uh, a few little fragments. I feel as if I have to make uh, an application to something like Ulipo to, to say this is how this is going to work and maybe it'll work in another way and maybe yet in still another way. But where to begin? Always our question. For me, a characteristic, a bad habit, a character flaw with a citation the citation appropriate in many ways to our presence, literally our appearance here. And it goes like this. As you can well imagine, I'm still in the process of writing this, so um, we'll see how this works. Hmm. One of the things that doesn't work, of course, is my trackpad. Uh, so we begin with a citation. It goes like this. There, that mountain, there, that cloud. Merely eliminate from them the phantasm of any, of any human addition. Merely eliminate from them the phantasm of any human addition, you sober ones. If only you could. There, that mountain, there, that cloud. Again, what in them is real? Merely eliminate from them the phantasm of any human addition, you sober ones, if only you could. How do we interrogate this Nietzschean sobriety? It is Nietzsche, of course, it is from the gay science, and it is something appropriate to our presence here. How, when one looks at that mountain, to recognize, to trace the contour of a certain kind of withdrawal, how might we apprehend this Nietzschean sobriety when we are constrained to place or recognize it to, and this is hardly a, a direct and unproblematic deixis, to whom do we designate the phrase, you sober ones? 
to whom do we convey such a phrase? To eliminate the phantasm so as to leave nothing but there, that mountain, there, that cloud, might seem to us impossible. But for us, the real would slip away with the phantasm and so immediately vanish. Linguistic usage maintains and activates a conflict between given geological formation and the common figure under which we might arrange all the peaks of the world. Everyday speech, a bit deceiving, whom we call Matterhorn, Zermatt, Everest, mountain. Or when we call the form passing over our heads here, now, even at night, the one disappearing in the distance, cloud. Take away what can be spoken and what will be left. The citation that appears here in Sasfe, in these mountains, as a vocalization, is a citation of a citation through which a philosopher appears, initially and anonymously inscribed at the hand of another. A reference, a citation authorizing another citation, Friedrich Nietzsche having written in Book 2, Section 57, Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft. The question that reappears again in another citation, a citation in a book, Does Hegemonie Brise, Broken Hegemonies by Rainer Schumann, a philosopher who takes up again this question. In this strange, brilliant, complex, and at times disturbingly affable book, Schumann describes it, this question and the taking up of this question as a contribution to that age-old principle, I'm sorry, that age-old doctrine of principles, a legacy that from the Greeks until now philosophers have never stopped speculating upon. Schumann says, and I quote, for more or less a century, more than one nightfall has descended upon the primary facts. I believe that the nightfall still needs to be retraced. Since when, and above all, in what manner did an undertow in these facts draw them toward their ruin? All that European humanity has made of itself in the first half of the 20th century and all that it is in the process of doing, it, doing to itself on a planetary scale in the second half that makes darkness so familiar to us must have distant and profound origins. There are good enough reasons to suspect philosophers of such shady dealings. Have they perhaps always received a return on their principles from dealings carried out in the dead of night? In any event, Truman goes on, philosophers today are rather more quick to confess that they know considerably less about foundations than their predecessors believed that they knew. <coughs> Giorgio Agamben, I was told by one of my students, remarked last week, perhaps sotto voce, perhaps in an apostrophe or an aside, uh, a small remark that perhaps it's too bad that we don't all speak Italian. <laughs> what are we to do with such a statement? What could such a thing mean? Certainly not the thing that appears on the surface. Yeah, too bad we don't speak Italian. It would be a nice thing. It would be a good thing. No, it's not that at all. Rather, it's something along the lines. And I can't help but think that... Uh, Giorgio Agamben would be quite aware of this, even in such a small remark, that it is exactly that situation wherein those phantasms that appear in that withdrawal, in that double movement, where one has in the same moment, at the same time, coextensive, a movement towards particularity, and singularity, that is to say, towards the imminent and towards the absolute, such that particularity has a reference, you and me, others, we who perhaps would benefit from speaking Italian, and singularity is an abstraction, a sovereignty without reference. In that sense, a phantasm. And it's the case, as Schumann argues, that um, it is incumbent upon us to pay close attention to the 
languages within which philosophy is conducted to the very fine register with a very fine comb to those appearances, even down to the point of a diacritical marker, a hyphen, an apostrophe, perhaps, wherein the potentia of such phantasms occurs. Far from mastering language, concepts live on it. They're born of words. Hasn't each of our historical idioms always instituted its own phantasmatic reality? How to form an address, how to take up a debate, a form of address more than a century old, one concerning epochs and thresholds that separate them without reconstructing and recomposing ages and transitions, indeed parenthetically phantasms, moments of objective spirit, constellations of the veiling and unveiling of being, epistemological apparatuses of knowledge and power, but by a commitment to the languages that philosophy has spoken, those small languages wherein one is constrained to not be carried away by any fad or fashion of the day, passing itself off as common sense. How to address the human addition that Nietzsche describes, how to address the withdrawal implicated in that address, how to see that mountain, how to understand that movement from the particularity of that one out the window. We can turn our head, look there, see it even in that cloud, the cloud on the mountain coextensive, how to address the particularity of that and to find that we move immediately to the abstraction <coughs> the singularity of that category, that figure, mountain, under which we can organize anything we call a mountain. <coughs> dog, anything that we might call dog. This is yours, tree, anything that we might call in any language a tree. When one says a dog, a tree, a place, a time, what comes to mind? Say the word dog and yeah, it's my cocker spaniel, it's your poodle, it's a chihuahua, it's a Grand Pyrenee, it's this, that, or the other thing. How are all these things, all these particularities organized under that rubric within that taxonomy? How are each a taxon of that general principle, that sovereign field without referent, but for a recourse to these particularities, dogs and dogs and dogs and dogs. It's an interesting problem that we have. It operates like a kind of double bind. Uh, that movement to, towards materiality, immanence, particularity, that movement towards uh, nominative, substantive, without a referent. What happens when we pose the question, what is law? We can discern laws, legislations, marks, uh, deistic signs, spatio-temporal coordinates wherein a certain law, a certain legislation, a sign, verboten, uh, a, a prohibition, passage interdit, uh, don't go here, stop, go, and things like that. And we can call these uh, deistic markers for uh, law, law which does not have a referent is, uh, in that sense, uh, sovereign and performative and absolute. And it is for us quite difficult to address that totalization, that absolute disposition. How to do that? How to talk about law? How to address those phantasms of our age? <coughs> The problem we have in our, our seminar on, on Foucault, ostensibly called, um, under, arranged under the title, Foucault's Mediology, the fifth, fifth instance of that, uh, an archaeology of, if you will, apprehension, within which we address this problem of dispositif, apparatus, disposition, uh, contraption, mechanism, inclination, attitude, tendency, 
gestell, constellation, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. How do we know what this is when we point to designate, indicate that thing, an apparatus? Ah, yeah, there it is. I see it. I see the impress of its passage. There it is. Just the moment that one looks at it as if one sees it out of one's peripheral vision, it vanishes <laughs> like a statue that one feels must have moved in that moment that one glanced away. <coughs> Where do we find this thing? What do we mean by dispositif? What disposition can we possibly articulate? And when we look at uh, a text like Deleuze, uh, a beautiful little text, a kind of encomium uh, with the greatest degree of generosity, a text uh, under the title Qu'est-ce qu'un dispositif? What is an apparatus? Deleuze does a remarkable rhetorical uh, maneuver. At the very beginning of that text, he says, essentially, I will write a text about Michel Foucault, Foucault, who uses often this term, this notion, dispositif, but what is a dispositif? There, the two, sentence, two sentences, uh, sentences that form this encomium, uh, a generosity uh, immediately succeeded by a violence. Now, a violence which is as generous as its introduction uh, of violence of Foucault. By the third sentence, Deleuze translates Foucault and Foucault's terminology into purely Deleuzean terms. It is the most gentle violation one can imagine. It is an <coughs> encomium which violates the disposition, if we can be allowed to make such puns, of that text, a violation that uh, casts Foucault into the same limit point, into the same kind of fix, if you will, the same kind of arrestment, stoppage, apprehension, grasp, <laughs> capture, that Foucault will perform on those writers for whom he has expressed greatest interest, those writers who are in the lexicon of that time said to write at the limit of experience, at the limit of language, at the limit of writing, to write of bataille in a preface to transgression and to take uh, and to see bataille in his frenzied eroticism, to see that bataille disappears into language in this way. And to contrast that with another writer for whom Foucault has an admiration, Blanchot. And to see how Blanchot, in his aesthetic austerity, similarly disappears into language, the transparency of the subject that might appear as the author of such texts, who might even be the armature for the kinds of culpabilities that Foucault has written about previously, notably in the small text on uh, what is an author. Um, that transparency disappears. That self-referentiality of the subject is gone. We find a similar thing that happens with Kosovsky and with others that Foucault writes about. Foucault, who is so concerned, directly and indirectly, with problems of appearance and disappearance, the problematics and problematizations of visibility and invisibility, here is subjected to the, the kindest, most gentle form of violence by Deleuze, a good friend, uh, to disappear in almost the same way. What better kind of homage to a friend than to occasion the disappearance so highly valued by Foucault? He does it in an, in an interesting way. It, it, um, I told you this is a, a sketch, uh, a schema, still in the process of being writing. I, I am uh, a bit uh, naked here without the, the solace of being able to hide in the folds of even my own text. I can't do it. So I will have to pull up things here and there in a somewhat inelegant fashion and uh, inflict them upon you in that way. Deleuze says um, in this section, uh, I'll quote the first, uh, the first paragraph. Foucault's philosophy is often presented as an analysis of concrete social apparatuses, dispositif. But what is a dispositif? There you have it precisely. In the first instance, it is, and at this point, he abandons Foucault's terminology completely. 
a tangle, a multilinear ensemble. It is composed of lines, each having a different nature. And then the lines in the apparatus and the lines in the apparatus do not outline or surround systems which are each homogenous in their own right, object, subject, language, and so on, but follow directions, trace balances which are always off balance, now drawing together and then distancing themselves from one another. Each line is broken and subject to changes in direction, bifurcating and forked and subject to drifting. Visible objects, affirmations which can be formulated, forces, exercised, and subjects in position are like vectors and tensors. Thus, the three major aspects which Foucault successively distinguishes knowledge, power, and subjectivity are by no means contours given once and for all, but a series of variables which supplant one another. It is always in crisis, a certain urgency, that Foucault discovers new dimensions, new lines. Great thinkers are somewhat seismic. They do not evolve, but proceed according to means of crises, fits, and starts. Thinking in terms of moving lines was a process put forward by Herman Melville, and in this involved, and this involved fishing lines, lines of descent which could be dangerous and even fatal. Foucault talked of lines of sedimentation, but also lines of breakage, of fracture. Untangling these lines within a social apparatus is, in each case, like drawing up a map, doing cartography, surveying all known landscapes, and this is what he calls working on the ground. He has to position, one has to position oneself on these lines themselves, these lines which do not just make up the social apparatus but run through it, pull at it from north to south, from east to west, or diagonally. One recognizes in this um, translation of Foucault, this abeyance or, or ablosen, this kind of withdrawal from Foucault's terminology, into uh, another terminology, a familiar one, the terminology precisely of the anti -Oedipus. A Very interesting, very curious kind of encomium. And in that withdrawal, in setting that proximity at a farther distance, in, in having uh, a break in the, the conventional understanding of the notion of fidelity, of bona fide, of a good faith, one understands Foucault via Deleuze. And from Deleuze back to Foucault in a way that one couldn't have articulated, achieved, or found in any other way. One follows the impress of those broken lines. Giorgio Agamben, who writes years later another text published simultaneously in French and Italian, the French title of which is resonant with the title of Deleuze, Deleuze article, Question Dispositif, the book of Giorgio Agamben, Question Dispositif. What is an apparatus? Agamben does a very interesting thing with that, and if we do pay close attention to those rhetorical strategies by which a text opens, Agamben does a remarkable thing. He cites someone who, and we have to be very careful in our pronouncement and interrogation of such deictic pronomials as who, he says, a philosopher for whom I have the greatest respect. This is how he phrases that. The sovereignty within that phrase is not dissimilar to what we've been talking about a sovereignty without a referent, or a referent that hides in the folds of that explication, a rhetorical flourish. Um, I'll give it to you exactly. Um, the very first line, the very first paragraph, I like the beginnings of things. I like those places and those means and methods by which a text opens itself to a certain question. One learns a great deal at the beginning of a text, a text that one can't possibly have any clue as to what will ensue. A very Foucauldian position, Foucault who says, if I knew what this was going to be about, if I knew what I would address, if I knew what I would write, why would I write any such books? It really is nonsensical, it doesn't work. 
So Agamben begins his text in this way. Sorry, this uh, trackpad is really quite bad. <coughs> Consider it part of the performance, huh? It begins with a Roman numeral one. Terminological questions are important in philosophy. As a philosopher for whom I have the greatest respect once said, terminology is the poetic moment of thought. This is not to say that philosophers must always necessarily define their technical terms. Plato never defined idea, his most important term. Others, like Spinoza and Leibniz, preferred instead to define their terminology more geometrico. The hypothesis that I wish to propose is that the word dispositif or apparatus in English is a decisive technical term in the strategy of Foucault's thought. He uses it quite often, especially from the mid-1970s when he begins to concern himself with what he calls governmentality or the government of men. Though he never offers a complete definition, he comes close to something like it in an interview from 1977. And here Agamben quotes in extenso, um, I recite that quotation for your benefit. What I am trying to single out, says Foucault, with this term is first and foremost a thoroughly heterogeneous set consisting of discourses, institutions, architectural forms, regulatory decisions, laws, administrative measures, scientific statements, philosophical, moral, and philanthropic propositions. In short, the said as much as the unsaid. Um, such are the elements of the apparatus. The apparatus itself is a network that can be established between these elements. We then have three ellipsis points and a hiatus, uh, another ellipsis, and Foucault continues, by the term apparatus, I mean a kind of formation, so to speak, that at a given historical moment has as its major fun function the response to an urgency. The apparatus, therefore, has a dominant strategic function. Another ellipsis, another hiatus. I said that the nature of an apparatus is essentially strategic, which means that we are speaking about a certain manipulation of relations of forces, of a rational and concrete intervention in the relation of forces, either so as to develop them in a particular direction or to block them, to stabilize them and to utilize them. The apparatus is thus always described, sorry, inscribed into a play of power, but it is always linked to a certain limit of knowledge a limit that arises from it and to an equal degree conditions it. The apparatus is precisely this, a set of strategies of the relations of forces supporting and supported by certain types of knowledge. The last little bit, uh, Agamben says then, let me briefly summarize three points. A, it is a heterogeneous set that includes virtually anything linguistic and non-linguistic under the same heading. Discourses, institutions, buildings, laws, police measures, philosophical propositions, and so on. The apparatus itself is the network that is established between these elements. B, the apparatus always has a concrete strategic function and it is always located in a power relation. C, as such, it appears at the intersection of power relations and relations of knowledge. <clears throat> so, as one reads this generous and complex little book of Agamben's, and one thinks uh, that here you have it, the possibility of understanding what we mean by, by an apparatus, and one takes one's leave of this book, it's without um, a kind of satisfaction that you know what the apparatus is, where it is, what it might be, how it comes into being, its manner of taking place, of uh, producing, enunciating, uh, displacing, arresting, uh, deferring uh, speech, language, visibility, invisibility, and, and so on and so on and so on. You actually are quite dissatisfied. You come away not really knowing very much at all how to attend to, to this dissatisfaction perhaps to recognize that uh, for Agamben, as for Deleuze, as for other commentators on this notion. The reason we have such difficulty with it, and we too, and certainly me, 
uh, is that it still remains for us a problem. It still is a part of what Foucault in what has recently uh, been called uh, in yet another introduction, as Wolfgang has pointed out, yet another book to appear very recently about Foucault, uh, occasioning the, the marks of Foucault's return, the Cambridge introduction to Michel Foucault, which periodizes, discerns three arenas, the archeological period, the genealogical period, and what they call the period of problematization, something Foucault was working on near the end of his life. The notion of problematics, problematization. Put simply, how something becomes a problem, how people attend to problems, and is really quite direct in this way. All of those texts, all of those in interventions, those that are, are cobbled together from diverse sources, those which were written directly, those that appear in translation, those very final texts, such as the writing of the self, where the problematization is how to make oneself to appear to oneself. How within writing, as Augustine describes it, a communication with the absent, how to cause to come into appearance, a relationship of the self with the self, how to write to one's self. <coughs> Plutarch at a certain point recalls, uh, a, is approached uh, in a letter by a, a young man who says, uh, my friend has died, I, I'm disconsolate, I, I, I don't know what to do with my grief, uh, I, I don't know how to handle it, what can I do? And Plutarch says, well, you know, I'm, I'm really a little bit too old uh, to, to help you with this, and I can't really give the time. I don't really have that much time left, but what I'll do is I'll send you my hyper memata, my diary, my book, the book within which I have written to myself in the manner so as to occasion myself to appear to myself in this writing, writing which has never had the intention to be read, but I will send this to you. Maybe it will help. A very different kind of disposition, usually such things, and, and these, uh, these texts, this story, these letters are, are not obscure. They're actually well known, but they're usually cast in terms of a kind of epistolary culture, letter writing in, in Greco-Latin uh, culture, often cast in terms of a kind of epistolary communication. They're no such thing in Foucault's terms. They're actually uh, a different kind of disposition. Again, disposition, attitude, inclination, tendency, potential, constellation, framework, all of those cognates, direct and minor, by which we can configure, translate, and defer this definition of apparatus that we give, apparatus, a curious term, one that enters into, uh, that translates dispositif, comes into English as apparatus, uh, when it enters into German, not so. We have the term apparat in German, it's something different. The cognate for dispositif, gestell, a curious thing. And framing, to and frame uh, a certain a circumscription, a, a bounding configuration, um, a curious thing. So these cognates, there are also other things, and again, with every skepticism that we can apply to the etymon, etumus logos, the reasoning of a happy fit, of course we should be suspicious with such things. By what authority does an etymological determination say that this is so? If we attend to those things carefully in their very language with that very fine tooth methodological comb that we're constrained to employ, that Foucault urges us to use, we see that in its own language. What authority do we have recourse to to say that yes, this is exactly what this means? Philosophy 
has such etymological claims. They're undone in a very interesting way. Um, Schurman has in a footnote, and I like footnotes as much as I like the beginnings of texts, as much as I like headings, as much as I like those strange little places in texts where something strange happens, where, where you're caught to something, where some apprehension to apprehend, to grasp, where you're caught up in something like a little rhetorical trap, something happens to you. And uh, there's a footnote, and I was delighted to find this um, in um, the end of uh, the English translation of uh, Schurman's book, Broken Hegemonies. Uh, and it's a footnote from Wolfgang Schadewald, a philologist not well known, most of whose work is out of print. I think there are three little volumes uh, available from Zurkamp. There are no English translations save one article. A very, very beautiful book that, uh, that Foucault gave me called uh, Monologue und Selbstgespräch, how to translate such a thing into English without the collapsing of these two terms into uh, each other to produce a kind of disfigurement. How would you translate such a thing? Marvelous, marvelous book. <laughs> Schadewald, uh, from whom Heidegger learned a great deal, uh, from whom he took certain etymological uh, conceits. You know. Schadewald does this very interesting thing with the word philosopher. Contrary to an opinion widely held since antiquity, the word philosophy does not mean what Augustine and many others have read into it. For the Greeks, the love of wisdom bore the name philosophy. This is from Confessions, book three, four, and eight. Philain sig signifies here not to love, but to appropriate. Suos in Latin, suos in French, sien. The philosophos is the one who pursues knowledge in order to make it his own. Uh, Schumann here cites the passages uh, from uh, Thucydides, uh, translated by Jacqueline de Romilly. Uh, and this is from uh, Schadewald in the Anfang der Philosophie bei den Griechen. The French translation renders that passage here in English. We cultivate the beautiful in its simplicity and things of the spirit without lacking firmness. According to Schadewald, it is necessary instead to read it as, we make the beautiful ours, philox lumen, in all simplicity, and we make knowledge, philosophomen, ours, without softness. Schadewald adds, one often understands the verb philosophein as signifying to love wisdom. Today we know that's wrong. The philosopher, philosophos has a view to appropriating a knowledge in the sense that he pursues it. What a curious thing. Certainly it, it undoes uh, a kind of cherished uh, etymological myth about what we mean to say when we use the word philosophy. And we're going to have a kind of skepticism about Schadewald's employment of this term uh, to be sure. But if we look at it in terms not of the, the capacity to appropriate, to grasp, to capture, if you will, to circumscribe, to take, to possess, so as to do something with it, employ it, deploy it, inflict it, apply it, what have you, but rather we consider that the operating term here is the pursuit of the possibility of possession of knowledge. In that sense, that pursuit aligns itself with what we might previously have called a kind of compassion, a kind of love of wisdom or of knowledge or something else. But it gives to it a different inflection, a different phantasm, if you will, a different uh, orientation, a different sovereignty. So, um, In this movement, a kind of double bind, a law which is set forth, which comes into place in relation to another law that contradicts that in relation to another injunction to 
choose in that law, the double bind that Antigone has to observe familial fidelity or the fidelity to the city. There is no possibility of making a choice that succeeds where one wins. It is exactly a tragic choice. So it's the, the tragedy of this double bind, tragedy within which, and of necessity which has a kind of temporality within which we recognize ourselves in that kind of exfoliation, where we recognize a kind of withdrawal, where we recognize in those things, in those forms of sovereignty. When we talk about an apparatus, a state, a law, when we talk about bio pouvoir, when we talk about hegemony, when we talk about all these sorts of things, they become, in this sense, and tragically, in that sense, by which we recognize ourselves as embedded in a temporality. We recognize those as the phantasms of our age, of those things that, that we approach as if by real, whose authority we cite as a ground, as a legitimation, as a uh, substrate, a foundation out of which emerges incipit and emergence and origins, and that which comes about incipit, inception, in capare, to capture that which is grasped at, which is secured in that, a security that leads immediately into uh, a second term. Regimen, governmentality, that which emerges from a ground or a foundation rests upon that foundation to secure its legitimacy, its persistence, its continuance, its deployment. Things that come into being in the world, come into being, show themselves fan astai, uh, as phenomena among phenomena. They come to show themselves. And they show themselves in accord with things among things. They rest upon that governmentality. There's a third term, Schumann also talks about this, as the kinetic origin of arche, the point where the appearance of arche as a philosophical term enters into philosophical nomenclature in a very strange way, with Plato and Aristotle to be sure, but in a strange and doubled ventriloquy, a kind of ventriloquism whereby it's the commentators on Aristotle in particular who have Aristotle describe Anaximander as having said, it is this, the boundless, that without limit and termination, that which goes ever on. And to whom Aristotle, perhaps in a ploy, effectively a tactic deployed by the commentators used to intervene in the Milesians and the Pythagoreans, uh, to overturn that influence and to say, no, there is a third Point, a third term, kinestai, movement. We need to have something that constrains, arrests, stops, institutes a series of stoppages, a series of recognitions and terminal boundaries that allows for there to be not just an endless and illimitable <laughs> extent, but rather so that we can have movement, difference, contingency, progress, teleology, and all of these other things, so that there can be something like the specificity of an age, an era, an epoch that moves from one to the next to the next, so that one can say something like, too bad we don't speak Italian. Or one might say, well, German and Greek are really the only philosophical languages. You can't do philosophy anywhere else. And uh, as a kind of counter to the, the, the totalization of that kind of statement, we would have to say, yes, and let's look very, very closely then at the manner within which is spoken. Let's suspend that pronoun there. Let's take that pronoun and put it someplace else. The manner within which is spoken the phantasms of our age 
in German, in Greek, in Latin, in Italian. Ah, in English. Um, so, <laughs> um, because this really is a kind of sketch, a kind of a sketch, a kind of drawing, a kind of, of drawing out. Um, I'll make a reference to this beautiful little book of uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, recently translated, on drawing. What, you might ask, does a philosopher know about drawing? Well, there's a kind of uh, divarication, a kind of duplicity in this. To draw is also to, uh, to open. A drawing is that which opens something, a drawing which is in its supplementarity, something which operates as uh, a preface, a preface which uh, <coughs> subsumes uh, without superseding that which it precedes. An opening, it opens something, and all the modalities of that opening are uh, appropriate and played out here in a sketch, even when we use this as a kind of metaphor, a sketch of what one might talk about when one addresses a problem of phantasmata, of the fantasies of our age. Phantasmata, an interesting point, uh, Giorgio Gambon, who also writes very early on, a beautiful book about phantasms, stanzas, word and phantasm in Western culture, a book that starts in the most curious way with a kind of list of sins. Esidia, justitia, melancholia, irae, all of these sorts of things. And these are then the kinds of phantasms, the noonday demon that appears, sloth, spiritual, corporeal, and otherwise. And all of these become uh, the initiating point, the operating procedures for uh, a complex and beautiful and poetic examination of the notion of phantasm, phantasmata. That which presents itself to our senses, to the resistance, astai, astenai, of our sensory apparatus, that which appears before us, which inflicts itself upon us, which we recognize regardless of the distinction, whether it be real or imaginary. As one dreams, you wake up from a, a dream. I uh, recently woke up beside my partner. She woke up a few minutes later, looked over at me, had a scowl on her face, and hit me. And, and, I, and, and I thought for, for the moment, what will I do? And then I, I turned to her and asked, what will I do? <laughs> and thinking, maybe it was something yesterday, maybe it was something, like, maybe something in my sleep. What could it have possibly happened? And she said, nothing. I'm pissed at you. I have a dream. In the dream, you were really an asshole. I'm still pissed. <laughs> OK. Well, what do you do with that? There, there you have it, a kind of phantasmata, a kind of phantasm. Because there she is. She's still pissed at me. You, this is incontrovertible. You can't take it away. It's not, not true. She's pissed. I didn't do anything. I'm innocent, I cry. Yet, there it is. And what happens when we sit in a movie and watch something that, that constrains in us a relationship whereby we are aroused, disgusted, annoyed, bored, uh, where the hair on the back of our neck stands up, where uh, your, your breathing becomes shallow, alpha waves diminish, small capillary action kicks in, and so on and so on and so on. Movies work, they always work. They work in this strange way. What happens in those technical regimes within which a body, yours or mine, some of you have already had this happen, are strapped into a device, a functional magnetic resonance imaging system, and somebody else sitting across from you, maybe it's Wolfgang, sitting in a similar device, and we sit there, and uh, Wolfgang will make a gesture towards me, like, <laughs> and the device that he's attached to will register in the parietal region of his brain, in Broca's area and Wernicke's area, uh, an infusion, an activity, a pattern of innervation that happens. And as I sit there and, and, look, and look at Wolfgang, and I wonder, what the hell? And yet I 
apprehend, literally grasp what Wolfgang has done because the device that I'm attached to produces an image of exactly the same enervation in exactly the same areas of my brain and his. A much more, this is by the way, it's called the mirror neuron system and uh, was sort of discerned, uh, theorized, written about, uh, uh, set into a series of elegant experiments around 1990 in Italy. It still continues on. I uh, didn't actually acquire the name mirror neuron system until fairly late. Um, it does so um, in a very interesting way because among those early experiments, something strange happens. It's a good explanation for how we learn things, uh, like monkeys, we imitate things. Uh, if we had to actually learn all that stuff, keep all that stuff up, up here, and even though uh, a certain conceit, like the, the new film of Luc Besson, Lucy, a nice little play in words, one might think, who uses successively 5%, 10%, 15%, 20 30 80 100% of her brain, and all of a sudden, all those science fictional cliches, she has control over her emotions, her intentions, her body, the bodies of others, matter, eventually the universe. How could a brain, even one that bears such a nice foundational myth as the, the notion that we use only 10% of our cognitive capacity, how could such a brain ever contain enough to learn how to do things like, well, what's the, the commonplace adage, walk and chew gum at the same time? How could we, for that matter, ever philosophize? So um, the mirror neuron system gives us an elegant explanation. Perhaps it's another phantasm, perhaps it's another model, perhaps it's another <coughs> metaphor. Works nicely, but there are curious things, curious mm, infelicities about this too, because something strange happens. I, I was so taken by this and so confused by this that I actually contacted these neurophysiologists and <coughs> cognitive scientists and asked them the question, why is it the case that when you set somebody up, like Wolfgang attached to one machine, and me attached to another machine, and in your experiment you put us in separate rooms, there's a wall between us, and we have a kind of intercessionary technology, a kind of mediation, a kind of, of conduit, a kind of transport of the movement when Wolfgang <coughs> makes for me this gesture, and I apprehend this gesture, and we see it via a closed circuit television, and we have recourse to, to the, the conceit of that live appearance. Sort of like when you tuck, 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 call a lover on the phone and you hear his or her voice and you think, it's them. Not at all. Uh, <laughs> we look and see, and the same thing happens to us. The functional magnetic resonance imaging system shows that our brains are activated in the same way whether we're there or not, whether it is a presentation or not, whether it's live or not. And in fact, who can tell anymore if a thing is live? All you have to do is have the word live appear at some place on the screen and uh, there is that enunciative apparatus that says live. We do that with a recording. I sit there and I look at a recording of Wolfgang from last week. Wolfgang looks, apparently, at me and goes, Thomas. <laughs> well, we can strip the connotations from that gesture. Nonetheless, the same thing will happen. So what happens to us in a movie? What happens to us when we see a body or when we find yet another conceit, yet another foundational myth that there is an ocular system that in some manner sutures itself to, is coextensive to, takes up position, dwells within, resides with the eye of a camera, an eye of the camera which detaches itself, which links not to a body, not to a landscape, not to a place, not to a site, a situation, a scene, but to something like a bullet. And our eye, and therefore our comportment, our corporeality is carried along with that bullet as it enters the body of another person, enters through its integuments, its organs, its bones, and we follow that, we go in a place where we could not ever possibly go. And we, to uh, perhaps 
disconcerting degree are constrained to follow that bullet, to follow that body, to follow that effect, to see that we have a kind of apprehension, in every sense of that word, a kind of grasp and a kind of uh, having been grasped by our interarticulation with a technology that presents for us impossible bodies. Buster Keaton in 1923 in a film called Playhouse uh, in a, an absolutely <coughs> marvelous composition, something that looks as fresh as contemporary today as it must have been in 1923, plays every member of an audience, every member of an orchestra, every member on stage, a janitor, and a monkey. And this matting, and if you know how this, this works, it's a very difficult thing. How many layers, how many times, how many configurations of, of this? What kind of apparatus has made this operate? And you look at Keaton's impossible body, an impossible body duplicated, bifurcated, fissioning, and splitting, and moving all the time. Notwithstanding the fact that in cinema, that it's cuts, elisions, slips, fades, dissolves, the national grammar of that also performs uh, a certain curious, different other thing for us. No color, it's black and white, and we find that we are caught up in the phantasm of that impossible body. Just as we are every time we turn on a screen, a television, a telephone, look at a movie, what do we see? We respond to that as if it were something there present in front of us, as if gradations and differences in luminance demarked differences in substance, as if those figures, flickering sensibilia and shadows, after all, cast on a wall, were actually there. And in some sense, we, our sensorium, our body, our apprehension of such a thing is not wrong in a certain sense. When one looks at an early film, Lumiere, 1895, 96, uh, demolition of a wall, and one sees a foreman who tells uh, a worker who appears in the wall, the pushing wall over the wall falls over, and he says to one of the workmen, go get something. And he turns, all within the framework of 50 seconds, turns around, walks over, and steps out of the frame. An exit which is both <coughs> fictional, that is to say phantasmatic, actual, that is to say phenomenological. <coughs> he really disappears but he disappears from the phantasmatic, sp phantasmatic space of the screen into the secondary phantasm of the Oshad, the off-screen space, and he reappears back into that space of the screen in a movement which is both phantasmatic and phenomenological at the same time. One can't help but think of the shared etymology of fan astai in that, of the presenting coming into appearance of something which is not, after all, there, the technical reproducibility of a shadow, the technical reproducibility of, and I guess this is the title, in a way, of the talk, the technical reproducibility of sensation, <coughs> that that appears. How to apprehend such sensations, not simply to be given over to these things that happen to us. But how to do something with this? Maybe this is a, a nice kind of Foucauldian question to uh, take up next, by the way, only a, a bit longer, not so much. Um, and to say, how to grasp a certain kind of phantasm, <coughs> a certain kind of place, that mountain, that cloud, how to grasp that. A certain minor writer about the sublime, whose name, forgive me, I forget, uh, it is one of those things, I left that book home, I'm gonna have to go home and look at it and write that into the thing that is, as I've confessed already, little more than a sketch, has written about the sublime. Maybe it's the fact that as we walk on, on one of those paths, and, and we look, we don't have the capacity because we can't take it in all at once. 
well, a commonplace in descriptions of the sublime, but less so uh, in that familiar sense, but rather because we look at this and we can't put it together with the next thing we look at, at that, and, and at that there's something about the disparity in its scale with regard to the disposition of our apprehension. We can't put those things together. We can't form a synthetic judgment by <coughs> which that will make sense. The sublime is nothing but the potential of an incompletable apprehension. We can't grasp the sublime. It's not that it is a, a substantive sovereignty, a field without a reference that recedes from us, that as we try to grasp it, we, we can't, that it somehow escapes our grasp, recedes away from us, but rather that that incapacity resides within us. We just can't do it because we in our particularity and in the particularity of that gaze, that engagement with the mountain, we can't circumscribe its immensity. No possible definition, one among many of the sublime. How to do that? And so this writer on the sublime just says, maybe that's it, an incomplete apprehension. Maybe that's what we talk about when we talk about the sublime. So, with that, I have one more remissement, one more thanks, and one more uh, I will ask a, a favor of uh, my partner, if she will consent to do that. I will ask a favor of you for 16 more minutes, and I will ask if uh, she would present for you something that is both here in that sense, there, perhaps there, that mountain, that cloud, another cloud, another mountain, at another place, at another time. A film made here in Sosfe, a film about, in one way or, or another, the small particularities, the magna magnitude of the sublime. Um, <coughs> in that sense, if I, if I could ask of you the favor, Leslie Thornton, would you please put on that film? The title, yes I do, I always have to pronounce the title. I think she might be still a bit miffed at me. Uh, no. <laughs> there, there you have it, a veritable rhetoric of authorial disavowal, yes. Um, the title, and pay close attention to, to the grammar herein. Philosophers walk on the sublime. There you have it. 